Well, as we come to sermon time, we continue to bow before the throne of God. We're in a worship service, an assembly of the Lord's people and guests to worship our Father in heaven through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we continue to do that even as we open the word of God to listen to him speak on a subject that will be important to all of us. I indicate to you this morning that that subject is difficult times. You notice that's in quotation marks. <laughs> Who am I quoting? <laughs> well, you may think, well, he's quoting me. Well, I could be quoting any one of us. Because all of us at some time or another have said, I'm going through difficult times. We as a church say, we've had some difficult times since COVID. Or we as a family may have had some sickness. We've had some difficult times. And I would suggest even on a personal level, how are you doing today? Well, I'm having kind of a difficult day, difficult time. So there's any number of ways in any number of areas of life, different levels where this term may be very common. Even in our prayer, it would not be unusual for any of us to pray, Father, help me in this difficult time. And so we pray to God to help us. And I would suggest that's very normal for Christians, and it's very normal for us to turn our attention to God and ask for his help, his awareness. And one way that God helps us is through Scripture. And one of the primary scriptures through which he helps us with this matter is 2 Timothy chapter 3, first five verses. The context of this, of course, is in a letter written to Timothy as a minister. And Paul is addressing Timothy with these specific instructions on what Timothy himself is to understand and what he is to help his brethren understand through his preaching where he is. So this is a very helpful epistle in different ways uh, to all of us. But spending a few minutes with this passage this morning will be beneficial, will be a good thing for our help. Let's read the first verse together. Paul started 2 Timothy chapter 3 by saying, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Now, when you study that and think about that, just read that as a good Bible reader. That says a lot to you. It said a lot to Timothy. It still says a lot to us today. But obviously, the Apostle Paul is bringing his attention to the fact that difficult times will come. I'd like for us to read this entire passage. Let's read it together. I have it on the screen in order that it might be before us. But you, of course, are welcome and encouraged also to have your Bible open to 2 Timothy chapter 3 in the first five verses. The first verse we have just referenced. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, Lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. And avoid such. Avoid such men as these. I would make some observations about this passage as a whole before leaving this chart that one of the things we want to notice in verse 1 is that Paul references when these difficult times are going to occur. He says, in the last days. That's very specific. 
We realize today, as we look at religious material, different study Bibles that are being published by a lot of different people, that dispensationalists have a heyday with this. And they will teach us that these last days is referencing a time that will not happen until just prior to the second coming of Christ. And when it comes time for Christ to come again in those last days, it will be difficult times. I would suggest to you that's nothing further from what the Bible teaches. The Bible does not teach that identity of in the last days. There are several places in the New Testament, but I draw your attention to just what this passage says. Second Timothy chapter 3, the first five verses, is one long sentence. One sentence. And that's pretty characteristic of the Apostle Paul. You begin reading Ephesians, the first chapter. You read a long sentence until you get, I think it's verse 14. Long sentence. Well, that's what Paul has done here. So let's Read the thought. In the last days, difficult times will come. Men will be, and then go down to the very bottom. Avoid such men as these. You get the point? This instruction to Timothy would be meaningless unless he were in the last days. <laughs> How meaningful would it be to Timothy in the first century preaching with the church at Ephesus for Paul to tell him of something that's even future to us? It's just a, a misrepresentation of what the Bible teaches. The Apostle Paul, mark it down in your own mind, in your own notes, that when Paul identifies the last days in this passage, he's teaching Timothy that we're in it then, in the first century. That these are the last days, and we will learn, as we can reference in other passages, that this lesson would be all encompassing on that subject, which it is not, is identifying the Christian dispensation. Acts 2, the Apostle Peter preached the same thing from the prophet Joel. These are the last days. They were the last days when the Christian dispensation started, and it will continue until. Christ comes again. That's what Paul is, in these last days, it's God's last dispensation of dealing with mankind. This entire Christian dispensation. And so we underline also that last expression that he said, I want you, Timothy, to avoid such men as this. That's his specific instruction. They're dangerous. They're harmful. I'm bringing this to your attention that you might be able to avoid them. Let's also notice that this expression, difficult times, can be understood in different ways. And we note that by looking at different translations. What you see, the difficult times, you will find in the New American Standard Bible, you will find in the English Standard Version, although times of difficulty, a slight variation there. But if you use the King James Version and the New King James Version, you will read perilous times. Well, that tells us that these times are difficult, but they're also perilous, dangerous. Dangerous times of spirituality. If you're reading from the American Standard Version, it translates this same expression as grievous times. That just simply identifies them as oppressive, heavy, difficult to bear, grievous, oppressive for serving Christ. Then the Christian Standard Bible translates hard times times that are challenging for living the Christian life. And then, as you and I might more commonly say, in our language today, these are tough times. Times are tough. So we have different ways of identifying the same period of time as identified by the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verse 1. But all of them come together to indicate conditions that bring a set-in, that's the meaning of the term 
difficult times will come. That literally translated from the original Greek language means will set in, like a thunderstorm. A thunderstorm sets in. There's a few clouds up here. It keeps coming. It keeps getting worse. <laughs> and finally, there's a thunderstorm, and it can be pretty severe. Well, that's the meaning of this language for difficult times. They will set in. They won't be here all of a sudden, all at once, but they will come, and they will get worse. And as happened through the centuries, cycle again, cycle out, cycle in. There will be times that are more difficult. But I would question, has there ever been a time since the first century that Christians have not had to experience difficult times? I would call our attention to the fact that Paul said, but realize this. That has a lot of meaning to us because what it means is, Timothy, these times will be difficult, but don't let them take you by surprise. Don't let them catch you off guard. Don't let them throw you for a loop as if something happens you didn't expect. These difficult times are to be expected because they're a part of the way that God handles his plan. And therefore, this language suggests an awareness with understanding. We'll mark that down. That's what we have. That's what you have. It prepares us to remain faithful. Link it back to the previous verses in the context of 2 Timothy. Some difficult times when people were in the snare of the devil. And it was Timothy's job, when possible, to get them free from the devil. Some will repent and some will not. But it helps us to relate to these times correctly. And that's really important. That's why in this subject theme for many weeks now, referencing subjects that will be helpful to us in the times in which we live, that will encourage us, that will inspire us to continue to be faithful Christians, regardless of what happens in this world around us. And that's the effect that Paul intends for this passage to have upon Timothy, upon Christians then, and upon us today. It helps us relate to these difficult times the difficult times that you may be having personally, at home, as a church, as a country, none of us would hesitate to say, this country is having difficult times. <laughs> so there are difficult times. This is the English Standard Version. You notice it doesn't say for men shall be or men will be, it says for people. And there's a reason for that. The word in the original language is not gender specific. Paul did not use men specific as opposed to women. He used gender generic, which means people, mankind. And so this is the way it's translated in the English Standard Version. In other words, what Paul is saying, people will be Okay. In other words, he's giving us information that these difficult times will be caused by what? Not by ETs, extraterrestrials, who have some kind of magical, mystical power over us earthlings and can mess our lives up. No, no, no. It's caused by our fellow human beings, by people, and maybe even reading this passage, we have to look at ourselves, maybe even by me sometimes. Maybe I'm causing a difficult time for someone, and if that be the case, <laughs> then I need to look at myself when I study this passage, because I don't think Paul intends for all of these 19 descriptive 
phrases and terms to be found all the time in everyone that's causing these difficult times. They may be, but it's also possible for us to have any one or any combination of them. So difficult times are caused by human beings, by people. Times become difficult by people with bad qualities doing bad things. That's just, just a fact. We, we look at uh, times that are difficult, that are people related. They're caused by people. And the reason they're caused by people is because those people have some bad qualities. And those bad qualities are causing them to do some bad things. And that gives us a real important source of information. That is, how do we fix this? How do we correct this? We fix people. We fix attitudes as best we can. Sometimes it's beyond <laughs> any possibility that we might have. But we try to fix people who have bad qualities doing bad things. <coughs> what Paul does in this passage, and that's the main body of this section of scripture, gives a rather detailed description, doesn't he? Let's call them causing qualities. What qualities will these people have that are causing difficult times? For people will be what? <laughs> How will people be? What will people be doing that cause difficult times? The way we're going to handle this it's not time efficient for one sermon time to deal with each of these 19 in a great detail. So what you will see on the screen is a grouping of these qualities that are at least closely related that suggest a bigger, more obvious quality. So let's look at the group, the first group. You will see it consists of six of the qualities of the 19. But if you read them, they all have something in common. They all have something to do with love. Paul said people will be lovers of self. They love themselves. They love money. They love pleasure. Immoral, sinful pleasure. They love it but they do not love God. They do not love even good things. Things that are good, they don't even love. And what is even worse, in my opinion, if I'm rating these, they're without natural affection. We look at the animal kingdom and we can see some natural instinctive things. I'm not equating that to what you and I feel is created in the image of God, but even the animal kingdom have natural, instinctive, caring, protecting of their own. And so, as parents, as people, we have a natural, inherent care, love, affection for people, for human beings, for human life. And what Paul is saying, these people that are going to cause these difficult times are even without that. They've lost even their natural affection. They don't have it anymore. Now when you look at just these six qualities, that's a pretty bleak picture, isn't it? Wow, these people, <laughs> you want to you wanna have some dealings? Well, we'd like to teach them the truth. We'd like to help them. But Paul is just simply presenting this picture. But let's characterize these. What's common of all those is they have a faulty, defective love. They have love, but it's all wrong. They have love for the wrong things. They don't have love for the things they should have. And so their love is truly defective. And so one can identify this and begin to question, okay, where is love in this? Is love absent? for what it should be present for? 
or is it present? Like Paul says here, for, for self, for money, greed, covetousness, and for sinful pleasure. That's a defective love. And that kind of love causes difficult times. Another grouping brings these three words together, and they all are familiar. Boastful, arrogant, conceited. Ooh, <laughs> it's hard to be around folks that are described like that. In other words, they're full of themselves. Egocentric, self-centered, boastful, brag, arrogant, conceited. That is a word in the original language that means swollen, puffed up or swollen with pride. But there's one thing common with these words that's brought out by, well, for example, William Henriksen. He said, these folks that are like this are on a mission, generally, to sell something. <laughs> they want you to accept something they have or something they're wanting you to accept. And we'll just simply identify it as peddlers of self-interest. These folks are just trying to sell, peddle their own mission. What is their desire because they love themselves. I want to push that on you. I want you to accept that. I'm so egotistical and so arrogant I'm going to be so bold as to make you do that. I'm peddling my self-interest. That's going to cause a lot of difficult times. Whatever may be the level of that. Then there is this one that may be so unsuspecting in such a list. Disobedient to parents, specifically stated in verse 2. Who are these people? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Who are these people? People that should be obedient to parents. That's who it is. Well, who is it that should be obedient to parents? Kids, children, young people growing up in the home. So that's what Paul has reference to here. These are the people. The young people even can cause difficult times. So what is so difficult about this? When kids are disobedient, when kids will not obey their parents, it is disruptive in some way or another to the parents, to the home, to the family. And we all know how broad and comprehensive those problems and difficult times can be. I would call our attention to something with this additional note. There are two times in the New Testament where Paul gives a catalog of these qualities. We're reading one of them in 2 Timothy, the other in Romans chapter 1, where he describes Greco-Roman paganism. And read that list sometime, if you will. It is very detailed about qualities that characterize paganism in the first century that was the product of the Greco-Roman culture. And you will be amazed. You think, well, that's talking about today. <laughs> that's like it is in 2023. Well, yeah, and that's why we call it neo-paganism. But one of the qualities that Paul also mentions that was true of the Romans true of the Greco culture, the paganism, disobedience to parents that brought the difficult to a part of. It certainly wasn't the only reason that the Roman Empire eventually fell. But the Roman Empire began to crumble. And the way it began to crumble was in a lot of different political ways. But homes began to fall apart. Homes were no longer patterned after God's will. Parents were no longer training their children to obey, to respect authority. 
And so kids grew up not knowing any better, or at least not wanting to, whatever may be. I don't know the description in every case. But this brings to bear upon all of us as parents, as young people. We have to do our part in training and in respecting, not only at home, but this respect that brings obedience to mom and dad also brings obedience to the school teacher, to the principal, to the policeman, and on we could go with those that have authority that keep a civilization without difficult times. But we have more to talk about because this list continues. And again, there's one that stands by itself. And you look at this one. Why do people act like they do? Why do people act like they're out of control sometimes? Will do anything, every whim leads them to do? Well, perhaps it comes back to this very one quality that causes people, people will be, how? Without self-control. And you take a person that is without self-control, <laughs> they're liable to do anything. They will do anything they want to do, anything the impulse leads them to do, or the crowd and the peer pressure pressures them to do. Acting without self-discipline. So many people today, we see over and over again, that do not have the ability to discipline themselves, to keep themselves, their desires, their lusts, their actions, in check so that they behave themselves. <laughs> and so we have a quality that is behavior without restraint. If you take people, and the more that there are, the more difficult the times will be that are without restraint and act and do whatever they want to do. Oftentimes justifying because I feel like this is the right, th well, <laughs> that's according to your own irrational justification, acting without self-control. Here's a group of five of these 19, and you read them and you say brutal or fierce. Wow, think about people being fierce headstrong, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, traitors. I mean, that's a group of qualities just by themselves again that makes some pretty bad people doing some pretty bad things. That word brutal means, it comes from a term in the original language that means untamed. It, it, it can be used with reference to animals in the wild that just live wildly. They're untamed. Well, this same word can be used with reference to human beings that are acting this way. Fierce, brutal, savage, barbaric, headstrong. Now this is first thought to be, I remember in looking at this term, thinking that it was synonymous with uh, self-willed. Headstrong, your self-willed, but that's not what this means. So let me try to clarify that. In the New American Standard Bible, it is translated reckless. So what this word is identifying, according to the original language, it means literally to fall forward on people. A person is this way is going to fall forward on people. And it's used to signify acting without thinking, without giving thought to what the consequences might be because they don't matter anymore. <laughs> to act recklessly, rashly, irrational behavior, all those are terms that, that are found in that term headstrong. So we want to make sure we have a correct understanding of that and not 
just self-willed because that's not exactly what that term is referring to. Implacable means, hey, you, you can never get me to sit down and agree with you. I will never come to agreement with you. We cannot make peace <laughs> because I am irreconcilable. I have an unwillingness to be recognized uh, and bound by oath or by promise. I simply refuse to be in that kind of relationship. Malicious gossip, that's hatred language. Where gossip is spread, bad things are said about people that are intended to hurt and be malicious or about traitors. Uh, a traitor is an individual who is, that's the word treacherous. Uh, think about something being treacherous. When it's applied to people, it means uh, to be a traitor. People who will betray your trust. Perilous times are caused by people who are abusive of others. And you go down the list is the detail that Paul has identified in this passage. And then there's a group of three. These three have a close relationship. Blasphemers to rail against what's sacred, to rail against God, or to have no gratitude in your heart for anything. You're, you don't appreciate anything is what that's referring to, unholy. And that unholy just simply means uh, to have disregard for anything that is holy, to be irreverent, to be living in disregard of sacred and holiness. So all of that has to do with one's attitude toward God. And so just as some of these qualities show an abuse of people, I, I give no thought to abusing people. And sometimes that gets very violent. I will destroy your property. I will steal from you. I will crash and run, as we see on the news sometimes, on the way this violent shoplifting takes place uh, in, in the world and how bad it's gotten. But it doesn't have to be that bad to, to qualify for what Paul is talking about here. But a total disregard for people, for people's property, will obviously extend into this attitude Toward God, I have a willingness, as these qualities show, if I have them, to abuse the God of heaven. I will speak against him. I will rail against him. I will deny a, 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 and everything that I can do to show disrespect and disregard for what is holy. This is number 19. <laughs> Finally, Paul said of them, holding a form of godliness, having denied the power thereof. Which indicates what Paul is indicating here. We're not to think of these folks being exclusively outside the church because Timothy is being instructed even to imply that sometimes these qualities are found in the church. Can you imagine what a church would be like to have individuals like this, if at Ephesus that Timothy had to deal with. And these individuals were going to look religious. They're going to profess religion. But what Paul said is only a form. It's only a shell. Because they have denied the power. It has not changed them. It has not influenced them. It has not made them into a better person. They can have that appearance of religion and still be the worst people on the face of the earth, according to our judgment. And so what this is doing is simply indicating that any profession to religion is only religious hypocrisy. We're going to move from that list to one final chart. I want us to think for just a minute about some things that you and I can take from 2 Timothy chapter 3 and the first five verses and benefit. And the way that that can be done is, I believe, the way Paul intended it. 
then and now. And it is to take some lessons where we can have some uplifting times, even in difficult times. <laughs> times are difficult, but that's no excuse for giving up. That's no excuse for quitting. That's no excuse for not serving the Lord. These lessons help us to have uplifting times in difficult times. Understanding difficult times is important to faithful Christianity. That passage brings this to bear upon each of us. It's there. Paul said what he said. He taught what he taught. Realize this. Your faithful Christianity requires you to have an understanding awareness that this is going to happen. It shouldn't take you by surprise. It shouldn't do you in. It's just a part of the way God has designed his purpose and the way people are and the way God allows them to be. Troublesome times are to be experienced with calmness and perseverance. Now, we don't throw up our hands and want to quit. We don't get all stressed out and ready to give up. Difficult times are troubling. But for a faithful Christian, they're to be experienced with a calmness in Christ and a perseverance that faith will give us the victory. Improvements can be made wherever possible by improving the defects and faults in people. That's what's going to change, whether that can be done on a national level, whether that can be done on a family level, whether that can be done on a church level or an individual level. Improvements are made by improving the faults, improving the defects, starting with self. Christians can never be a contributor to this kind of difficult time. You look at how difficult times are. I say, man, there's so many people doing those bad things. I'm just going to go out and join the crowd because that's the thing to do. Well, a Christian should never, never, never be a contributor to what Paul is talking about. That's the reason he writes this passage. Christians should always be a positive influence for Christ and for his church. We understand difficult times, thankful to passages like this and so many other passages in Scripture. God has given us a lot of help, a lot of answer to our prayers in the Scriptures that he has given to us. And we should always, no matter how difficult times may get, be a positive influence for our Lord and for his church. Uplifting times in difficult times. One last exhortation. Do not let difficult times ever keep you out of heaven. They have some folks. Sometimes difficult times cause people to give up and quit. The encouragement that we try to get from the scriptures, from our assemblies, from our teaching, from our preaching, is to help us endure peacefully and calmly the difficult times. But a final closing exhortation is do not ever let difficult times cause you to miss heaven. They are some folks, but don't let it do that to you. Don't let difficult times prevent you from becoming a Christian. If you're here this morning and not a Christian, don't let difficult times discourage you from giving thought to the fact that you need to be a disciple of Christ. You need to be obedient to the gospel. Don't let difficult times cause you to continue to be in an unfaithful Christian situation in which you have sin and it's guilt between you and God. Seek forgiveness. And if we can be of help to anyone in this assembly this morning, please come to the front and let us know while together we stand and sing.